Hi. It has been so interesting to hear you, Heli, talk, and you. I don't come from design world. I originally came from management consulting, but I think that today's topic includes everyone and everybody who is working anywhere with people. And I think that that is all of us are doing that. Whether it is helping our clients with better design or whether it is like understanding other kind of customers when, when you are talking to them, for example, or whether it's with your teammates, your closest ones, or maybe it's your, your the whole culture or in emotional environment around you in the, in the company. But most often also how you manage yourself. How, what kind of relationship do you have with yourself and your emotions? Because what I heard here, you were really courageous by taking chances and, you know, looking at your mistakes. And you was like asking Twitter to tell them, tell him that, okay, what kind of design problems have they, have they made? So that's really vulnerable. And that takes guts and that takes that you have to also understand yourself better. And that is my, my hope today, that, that I give you a little bit more curiosity towards emotions, whether it's your own, your team, and, and by understanding them a little bit better, looking at them a little bit more, you might understand new perspectives and also that you might want to change something. We cannot manage, we cannot control emotions. They are a bigger thing, but we can lead them by doing tons of stuff. And as I mentioned, my background is in management consulting, so I come from business world. But, but also, in my job, the customer experience was a core thing because my passion was service management. So how can we create more business by having better encounters? And during that work, and also later I was a project leader in one marketing company, I noticed that there was this one thing happening between people and it occurred to me and it also occurred to my friends and my colleagues. And the thing was that we were really skilled. We were like educated, we had the motivation, we had the inspiration, we were ready to work. But then something happened between, between us people and we didn't perform. The results went down. But also there were situations I remember vividly, for example, there was only a team of three. We were working late, like 11 o'clock, the budget was like a million, and we were like really going so deep sometimes, with, you know, desperation. But also we were like, I remember times we were, you know, laughing, laughing at the customer's uh, smoking area 11, at 11 p.m. And at those moments, there was something happening between us that made us rise. We were more than one plus one. We had something between us. Something was happening here that made the performance go up. And I started to wonder, and I, this started to bother me more and more. Okay, what happens? Because it was really sad, because I'm quite a deep person. And one time I remember I was in Gala near me, we had a meeting room there, it was beautiful sea view, and I was there with my colleague. I was in the marketing company then. And my colleague said to me that, Camilla, we have to come up with the idea for the customer. And he was like, looking like this. First of all, I di did know that creativity doesn't work like this, but that was not the main point. But the main point was that I had this crazy idea in my head. Yes, I was like, oh, yes. But what I also realized was this strong voice inside of me saying that, no, don't say it. And I later analyzed it and, you know, wondered that why did I not tell him the crazy idea? 
Why did I tell him only this basic safe idea? And now what I concluded was that actually I had remembered in that instance that when I last time was, this, was in this kind of similar situation with the same person, he made this really small thing, this. Just a little movement with eyes that made me feel embarrassed, like, okay, this was a stupid idea, yes. Yeah, maybe I just, yes, of course, it won't work. Let's, let's do this basic thing. So, as I said, um, I'm a deep, I had a radio show called Deep Shitty, Tunteet Työelämässä, yes. Uh, so I, I start to always wonder that, okay, on the micro level, how will this affect my motivation to work? I had just came back from mother leave. I was like so motivated. I was like, no more diapers. Through my hands, I was like, my turn. And I was like, okay, how can I handle this for 40 years? For the next years? If I you know, start to take these basic ideas, my motivation will also go down. But also I started wondering that, okay, what about this company? What about if all of us start to behave like this? That we all only get those basic ideas, or tell those basic ideas. And what about Finland? If all the companies start to make these safe choices, we won't be competitive then. So, really, <laughs> then I started to, well, I quit my job and I, for the seven years I have been now teaching companies how to lead emotions and how to do something about it so that these kind of things don't happen. And when I talk with companies, I, I also notice that it's more about trust. It's the trust issue. And I drew it like this one time. I was actually listening to other people, I was in a seminar, and I noticed that they were all the time, the speakers or the, the managers or leaders were asking people to give, create, innovate, tell, be more, asking all these things. And I drew on the other side, the other person who was like, you innovate yourself. Why should I take the risk of being ridiculed, being embarrassed, and that's not even the, the, the only thing that can happen. I have heard many stories about people getting fired, for example, because they have had the guts to tell the truth, and top management has seen them as a, them as a troublemaker, and things have escalated. So this is not a question of just me, you know, deciding to say. It's also our older system who protects us and keeps us alive that says that, okay, no, no, don't say it because it's not safe. You don't want to be thrown out of your group. You want to be included in the group. That's one of our survival skills that we want to be together. But as I said, what happens to companies if we don't get the ideas? What if we don't hear about the problems? That is also quite often the case. I was just two days ago interviewed for a magazine, and uh, they had this anonymous story about, about this one woman who had her experiences at work, and they wanted me to comment on that. And really, it was amazing, a terrible, thing to hear what had happened to her and how brave the team had been in bringing up the problems to the leaders and how the leaders had shouted and in a way forced all the people to not say out loud the problems but instead everybody learned that we only tell good news. And that really made me think that how stupid is that? that you're paying people to lie. And that is a real thing. So, what can we do to prevent this from happening? Because it's in a deeper level, like I said, it's not just a decision. And two things are needed. First of all, of course, we need this courage to tell. We need 
courage to raise our hands when we see something negative happening, something that is not right. But that's not, it, not enough. Because if the environment doesn't respect that, if the environment is hostile, these people who, are, who have the courage, they will stop. It's like Adam Grant talks about givers and takers. They are the, like the givers. But if there is not, no respect in the organization for that, they will understand that, okay, this is stupid. So we also need these skills to receive. So our ability that when we see somebody telling something vulnerable, we understand that, okay, that took cuts. I would respect that. I won't roll my eyes. And all these little things. Because if, if we don't manage these things, this environment, when there are emotions, they, they, they might, you know, lead to terrible things. In Finland, many have maybe heard about these studies about Nokia mobile phones. It was in Silas Ma's book, really good capture about the mobile phones, that, okay, what happened to them? How did they lose the market share? But also, there was a real study made up about Nokia, which wanted to find out that, okay, what happened? And what they concluded was, in one summary, was that Nokia collapsed because of fear. Fear that was among the middle management that so that they didn't tell the truth to the top management, who then made wrong strategic choices. So as we can see, emotions, even when they are not expressed, people were silent. Do you know the situation when there's a meeting and in the end somebody asks that, okay, has some, anybody has some, somebody has something to say? And everybody's like silent. And we think, okay, everybody's agreeing. But maybe they are afraid. Maybe they, nobody has the guts to tell the truth. So really, silence even can have this kind of a dramatic consequences. But on the other hand, we also might, you also might have heard about um, Aristotele project, Google's five-year study about what makes the best teams? And I as I described our three-person team with, with smoking and stuff, I think we had the psychological safety. We had the strange something that I won't leave you, you won't leave me, together we can make this. And yes, we made it. We, made, we, were, we got awarded by our, our project had the best customer satisfaction of the whole, the whole company that year. So we really made something special. But also, it's really, I think it's so amazing that what this study found out was that the teams were completely different. Some teams were really structured, some were, teams were bohemian, and there was nothing in common with them until they found out that inside of these teams they have the safety. And I, I love Ed Catmull. I think his book is one of the best I have ever read. I'm sorry, this is a little bit messy. These are my notes from Nordic Business Forum where he was talking. But I want to highlight here two things which I think are amazing and really combine maybe those two things that I mentioned before. So first of all, Ed Catmull says that, that, that you think that the, the First ideas for, for Pixar movies is, yes, he's a founder, one of the founders of Pixar with Steve Jobs and Lasseter. So he said that you think that the first ideas for our movies are always great, but he says that they are not. They are not, they suck. But the main thing, he says, that what is his job is to protect these people who have the courage to say out loud these crazy ideas. So really protect these bold individuals. I would have needed one. Because inside of that first bad idea might be the seed for the ne next blockbuster. 
And the other thing I want to highlight is, oh, let's go back. Yes, is here. He says that he wants to know the problem. So opposite of the Nokia case, he wants to find out from the back channel info, find different channels that he, he can hear all the problems that prevent his people from flourishing. So what kind of small things he can do there so that people can do their job properly? I think, I think that these are the way should we, we should be working. Great just in looking at the, the ideas. And as mentioned here, be open to, to, to different perspectives and really open for things. But also, if you're, if you're not yet with me in this looking at emotions more closely, I also want to highlight that many thinkers say that it is one of the core skills of the future. So, as we all know, we will get tons of help from, from artificial intelligence, digital products that help us, and they will do most of the, the linear logical stuff. All the things that we can predict or can be coded or put in algorithms, we will put, do that. So we don't need those basic ideas in a way, things that can be, can be seen beforehand. But what cannot be seen is often your unique combination of things, the way you think when you're really free and you're not afraid, when you really combine your hobbies and personality and, and your thinking from the, from the bus stop, all these things. Because these are di difficult for, com for computers to do. Also, it's difficult for computers to be these things, this kind of creativity, emotional intelligence, complex problem solving. All these things are in a way, I call them fluffy skills, mössö taidot. Because you can read about them, you can study them, but you cannot put them in the Excel that do this and you will succeed. For example, creativity. There is no one way to do it. Or emotions. I cannot give you exact steps to take if somebody's sad. I can give you skills and I can give you tips, but in a way, like it was mentioned, it's more about the mindset than a certain skill. And I can tell you, I teach a lot, a lot of people and a lot of companies and engineers a lot, and it's really alarming for many people that, oh my God, there's no one answer. No one tool that you can give me? No. But good news is, if there's not, not one, there are thousands. And let's look at that next. So how can I be wiser in my encounters with myself? How can I make sure that we are not going down because of something that happens between us people. And unfortunately, this work has to start with yourself. So instead of blaming that, okay, it's the, it's the politicians that make me feel that, that this way, or traffic jams, or my boss, or coffee machine, we have to turn the finger on ourselves. That, okay, I am feeling this, so why am I? reacting to this so strongly. Emotions tell mostly about the one who is feeling them. So be curious. And, and also, if we aim to create those environments where there is trust between people, we must first be trustworthy ourselves. And that requires that we, for example, look under the hood and see the disappointments, the when we are afraid, envy, things that often people are not so comfortable with. Because the worst, worst thing that can happen is that you say the right things, but your other communication channels are saying something else. 
I think that's like the worst thing. Because then people are like, okay, I'm not sure. Hmm. I should be really a little bit alert because, because I'm not sure what he's really thinking or she's really thinking. So the truth will come out anyway. So to have these real conversations with yourself that am I rolling my eyes? How am I behaving? What kind of habits do I have? Do I have a habit that when I take coffee in the morning at work, I complain about the weather or traffic? Why do I do that? Does it benefit me or others? So becoming aware that, okay, how am I behaving? It's, I call it ouch. It's like this ouch when you realize that I'm, I'm behaving that way. And it's a lifelong process. You learn and, and learn and learn especially if you have teenage kids. They are really good at pointing different things. And then the next step is to, to look at emotions. And this is really the most intriguing part for me. Because when I was 25 and had started as a management consultant, I didn't understand emotions at all. I thought that they were, they were just came here to trouble me, to, to you know, to bother me, that go away, I have work to do, I have schedules, go away, anxiety, stress, why are you doing this to me? And I also see a lot of people thinking that if I don't show anything, if I'm like this Teflon type, then I must be leading emotions. No, you're not. You are actually blocking everything down, you're like creating this time bomb inside of yourself. Because emotions are on all the time. There's no off switch. They are happening whether we realize them or not. So this is not leading of emotions, if you like. I, I call it fake calmness. But this other end of the continuum is not leading of emotions either. This situation where you'll think that, okay, I can show my emotions because I'm this kind of person, I can yell and scream. I'm mad, I can express myself. Then the emotions are leading you again. Or if you get, only, get stuck in certain emotions, that I swim in the emotion, I'm, I was hurt, and then you, you, you continue with that for two years. That's not leading of emotions either. But the way to understand emotions is to understand that they bring us information. And I think it's so unused potential that in each situation you could listen to the fact channel, but you could also listen to this emotion channel. And by combining these two things, you could be, make so much wiser decisions. And the emotions, they bring us information. They are like all the time scanning the environment and making us feel something based on what the situation is in correlation to our values or interests or hobbies or whatever. It tells you information. So don't compare it, just be curious. Why do I feel so excited always when I come to this environment? What does it, this tell me about my situation, my, my interest, for example? Because Excitement, for example, pushes you energy and it tries, it tries to move you towards that thing. But on the contrast, fear in a certain situation might make you feel that <clears throat> I want to go away. Or I put my no nose like this, there might be something wrong with the morals there. So emotions are really interesting to tell you about you, your values, for example. And the next thing, or actually at that point when you are understanding uh, there are emotions, try to name them in more detail. If there would be a magic wand or one quick fix to emotions, this would be it. Because this is so beneficial. And so many psychologists have told me that this is the main problem. People do not identify the emotions in detail. We say that I feel bad, 
but we should be more precise. Am I envy? Am I sad? Am I frustrated? Am I disappointed? They are all different emotions and they are all telling different things and we should also behave different ways. And also, this does two magical things. It will, when you know how to name emotions, it will increase your emotional intelligence. And that, again, is the core thing about emotional... Uh, the naming of the emotion is the core thing in emotional intelligence. And also, what I think is an amazing thing is that brain researchers, like this Dan Siegel, he says that name it to tame it. So when you are able to name your emotions, you also calm your brain down. So it's quite effective if your stress and anxiety, whatever takes you, is trying to take you over. You say it out loud or write in a paper, I feel anxious, I'm afraid, I'm just something. And then you can maybe understand better that, okay, what am I nervous about? What am I disappointed about? But it really, it, it helps. And then as a last thing, as I said, there is no magic wand, there is no one quick fix, but on the contrary, there are tons of things you can do. Tons of things where you can change the emotional environment like this. Like I said, the rolling of eyes. It took only a few seconds and it changed my behavior. And that you can always choose. Do I smile? Do I encourage people? Do I show mean face? All those things will have effect on us people, because we read our faces all the time. But one of my favorite things, and I want to give you one, of, uh, one concrete tip, is to always ask one question before reaction. And this is really... Um, comes from Viktor Frankl. It's amazing. He's amazing therapist who has uh, created logotherapy. And he says that we humans have this choice that whether this, we are in whatever situation, stress, schedules, whatever comes, that there's this stir certain stimulus, we have always the space to decide that what does this mean? What do I want to do before we react? And in that situation, I think that when you are with your colleague, you can think that, okay, what kind of, how do I read him? What kind of, what kind of assumptions do I make? Or regarding your own thinking and emotions, do I really feel this way? Was this all that it, it is? Often emotions come in, there are many emotions, so, so when you say out loud once, one, there's second, third. And of course, what do you decide to do? Last time I did this, maybe now I change this. So giving this space. And also this one question rule is beneficial because if, for example, your colleague is telling you about the idea, then when you ask one, more, one question instead of saying opinion or decision even, you, by asking one question, you tell him or her that, okay, this is interesting. And also, secondly, if there are strong emotions in you, when you ask one question, you might have time to calm down a bit. Again, with teenagers, really important. Like, yes, darling, why is this so important to you? <laughs> yes, sometimes I'm able to do that. But summary, we are moving towards this kind of society. So maybe emotions were not so important when we were in the fields or we were in the, in the factories. But now when our information and knowledge era is, is like peaking, we are all the time disturbed, all the time we are bombarded by different information. There is the next stage when Artificial intelligence will do that stuff in the future and we can concentrate in, on the things that we humans are still best at. Like I said, social interactions, emotional intelligence, creativity, understanding weak signals, be, really be in the encounters. And if you're interested in learning how to understand the language of emotions, it's completely doable. 
But you need to start with yourselves. Like I said, look at under the hood. How does my thinking and emotions and actions link together? And I, I bet, I can promise you that when you look at yourselves first and then look outside, your colleagues, family, friends, you can see these same patterns because we are all humans. And Kahneman says that languages are the system one capabilities. They are automatic. And like, like now, because you understand English, you cannot even put your brain in a position that you wouldn't understand what I say to you. And that would also happen with emotions. You start to hear what the customer is saying beneath those facts. You will get so much better. Best salespeople do this all the time. That they are, if the customer is telling that, oh, I need these five things. And, you know, the competitors get the five things. But the real, really good salesperson who is emotional intelligence, he will also be listening to the emotional channel and maybe asking that, okay, I get the sense that there's still, still something bothering you. That is there something else I can help you with? And the client might be like, Actually, there is. There is this one thing. And then you get the sixth thing. And when you put that into your offer, the bets are on you that you win the prize. And it's amazing, Haley, that we stop in the same word. Be good. <laughs> so, last picture is one of the most important pictures that I have drawn. Um, because I think that this leading of emotions is not some extra skill that you should maybe take on. I think it's our responsibility. That we all should have the skills to learn, to understand and handle our emotions. Because we don't have the right to just put the shit forward. We have to make sure that when we go and encounter other people, we put good forward. And think about it. It only requires that we all do one thing. We take responsibility for our own behavior. And I want to leave you with that challenge. So, I hope that I have been able to give you more curiosity about emotions, and I dare to, you to look at them. I love social media, so if you are into that, so you can find me especially in LinkedIn and Instagram. Thank you.